Okay, T today is the, uh, well, I should say the beginning and end of the uh, special relativity by wave mechanics. And the uh, <clears throat> thing that I'm preparing you for today is the final exam on Monday at 3 to 5 in this room, in which you'll be asked to take a nearly blank graph paper and build the uh, structure of both the wave and then the mechanics of this hiding uh, under that wave, which we will do today. Actually, we'll uh, take two turns with the blanks that I've put on your uh, desk there. And we will use a compass today. So before we get too far here, and, uh, let's make sure you have one. Uh, anyone here that doesn't have a compass in take advantage of our little compass store here, which is for free, at least in borrowing. Um, this one right here, which is a pretty cool one, which goes as a pen. So anybody need um, a compass? Um, this is one that holds a thing that takes a long time to uh, open. And then <coughs> most of the time, I'm happy just to use cheap ones like this. In any case, uh, we will need those. They're, they're uh, essential uh, for um, a couple of things that we're going to be doing as we construct uh, the mathematics of both relativity and next lecture. We'll use the same table, but we'll do quantum mechanics. Now, the uh, picture that I'm showing here is the, something we mentioned just at the last part of the last lecture in which I <coughs> solved the, uh, shall we say, the lover's quarrel about who has a shorter meter stick or whatever uh, in the uh, case of different reference frames. And when each one of them says the other one is short, if it was classical stuff, that would be ridiculous. But when we're talking about waves that we send to people, uh, no question that the waves get shorter if you're in a different reference frame and I shine a red laser at you. If I'm coming towards you, that's going to be uh, a shorter wavelength and a higher color like green. And if I'm going away, it's going to be reversed. And that's one of the things that I want to um, make very clear as we go into this, the Doppler effect uh, for this, both the red and the blue <coughs> are on opposite ends of this table. And then all of the other wave phenomena that are uh, second order, this is definitely first order, the Doppler, but the uh, ones that are either first or second order that are here have the property that um, just as the Doppler here is the inverse of this one, the, the blue Doppler is the inverse of red, either the plus row inverse is either minus row, and so on. Well, the next column over, same thing. Uh, <clears throat> this, this is an inverse quantity of this one. This is the old-fashioned notation for relativity, which we're not going to use that much because it's a pain in the butt. And then, the, and so forth, as you come in here, this one is the inverse of that one. Finally, in the center is one we talked about. Uh, having the Einstein time dilation and the Lorentz uh, space contraction, uh, those are reciprocals of each other. Um, kind of interesting. So, we've got to flesh out some of this physics and mathematics and, and show uh, some of the ancient geometry, Thales' uh, um, rectangle in a circle and uh, the geometrical mean, those are all part of the story today. So let's get started. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is this little problem here uh, algebraically and I'm going to go ahead and turn this one off for a while. We can bring it back later uh, when it called for and I hope it doesn't goof my um, <coughs> computer up completely here. It looks like it's coming back. Uh, so this is where we uh, we'll begin today, and um, typical problem I call this double jeopardy because we're going to answer the 
the quiz here, uh, as they do on that television program called Jeopardy. But anyway, the idea is to what velocity u, uh, u equals, e stands for equals, uh, what velocity must Bob accelerate uh, so he sees beams with equal frequency. So right now he has a nice gentle 300 terahertz infrared beam uh, coming from coming from the, the, this side, coming from the right, and then um, the, the, the uh, nice, uh, beautiful 600 terahertz, blue-green actually, blue-green, and not much blue in that, but bear with me. Uh, the idea is that if he uh, can run away from this wave fast enough so that if Doppler shifts down to some frequency, omega equal to this one. So the idea is how fast does he have to go uh, in order to find what's really going to be our center of momentum. So we're reproducing with waves here what we started this course with, with particles bouncing off of each other. We're throwing light against it, each other now and asking for a center of momentum. That's really what we're doing. We'll get into that when we do the quantum mechanical stuff uh, on Wednesday. But the idea is, first of all, to find out um, what, how fast he has to go and to get equal frequency from both of them. And what is that equal? What is that uh, omega equal, you see? So this is a, a, a nice problem that you should be able to solve easily, both algebraically and geometrically. And it will set us up for doing the complex geometry that we started uh, in the last lecture. So um, let's uh, answer the first query here as they do in Jeopardy by answer by question. So the answer by question comes when you ask, what is the beam group velocity? In other words, what group velocity do these two light beams make by interfering with each other? That's the key to all of the stuff that we're doing, really. And the group velocity, this quantity here, is the ratio of the frequency over the wave num uh, number, the k vector, if you will, the Kaiser number, and the Hertz number could be a nu and a kappa, or 2 pi times that, which this is, omega or over k. Both of them are a ratio that uh, will give us the answer to this. That is, uh, whatever this frequency omega coming from the right is, minus whatever frequency in the one uh, uh, this one going to the right, this one going to the left. I'm just subtracting and uh, realize uh, that I can rewrite the k for this one with a positive thing. Uh, the k for this one is negative, so I put a plus sign here, and I get a ratio of difference over sum of the frequencies that are here and here. Now the omega has an extra 2 pi that this doesn't. We're doing terahertz up here. We're doing radians per um, nanosecond or something like that there, doesn't matter, the ratio is canceling all that out. So what the answer then is, when you put those numbers in, 600 minus 300 over 600 plus 300, okay, one-third the speed of light. He's got to get going at one-third the speed of light into this beam and away from that one in order to get the frequencies equal, because that's the group velocity. That's the center of momentum. Okay, cool. Very similar to Super Bowl stuff that we were talking about a long time ago. However, there's a coloring to this thing. There's some energy involved in this, as we'll see later. The frequency is energy. We've already talked about the Planck's rule. And the uh, answer to this question is, what is that frequency? Well, uh, what is both the blue shift of the left one and the red shift of the green one. Well, that's pretty easy. Just take this algebra equation, turn into that, okay, and then substitute back uh, the uh, the omega, the, what, what the b is, solve for it. It's the gold. Uh, it is the geometrical uh, mean of those two frequencies. So there's the geometry showing up in the algebra, basically, right there. So uh, what you have to do then is uh, calculate that geometrical mean, and we're going to do that 
uh, by geometry very shortly here. Remember in the Super Bowl thing when we looked at the uh, Super Bowl crushed against the floor, the circle made a, 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 a flat on the, on the Super Bowl, and the question was uh, how big was the uh, uh, spot, and it involves the uh, uh, geometrical mean of the depression, and then what was left of the Super Bowl, the product, the square root, the square root of the product. So what's going on here is very simple. So what we're getting is 424 uh, terahertz if we have 300 terahertz and 600 terahertz there. So that is um, the answer to this particular uh, example right here. So <clears throat> what we're doing here, you see, is we're making use of, of a ratio between um, group and phase. And that's going to come up uh, later on. But in any case, this geometrical mean uh, is uh, what we uh, want to find. But now uh, what I'm going to do is have you do that geometrically. We have a piece of graph paper there that has a 600 terahertz uh, beam going that way, like the picture. And then it has the uh, 300, the infrared 300 terahertz uh, going uh, this way. And these are in units of 100 terahertz right here. And that's the important thing in all of these graphs. Now we have to be very precise about our units. So uh, when I'm doing the uh, Kaiser number, the wave vector, the per space uh, dimension uh, 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 down here, okay, well, I'm going to be using, in order to make this thing a frequency, C times wave number. Uh, and we're talking about each of these units here being 100 terahertz. So we're going to, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And then we go up here, and that's just plain old uh, frequency there. So this is per time versus per space. This is the in, inverse uh, uh, relativity playground, if you will. Okay, now, uh, one of the things you know, notice right away um, is I've already drawn a line here uh, that uh, uh, shows you where these two uh, kind of meet. And the idea is that we're going to be uh, making out of the diagonals of this arrangement of vectors, namely these guys are just going speed of light, but we're going to be making things that are very different from that particular speed. One of them faster than light and the other one slower than light. The one faster than light is going to be this way, uh, slower than light this way. So uh, let's get that going on both of these uh, screens here. There's the phase, okay, and remember uh, when the slope of the phase vector uh, was right on the axis, and that means you would be in the in the um, in the center of momentum frame for the two light beams, uh, they would both be the equal frequency. That's what we're attempting to achieve here geometrically. And when that uh, phase gets right on the uh, axis, then the phase uh, you remember uh, goes infinitely fast in the space time. So, as I say, this is a control panel here. Uh, we push this button right here to make the light that comes uh, this way, and we push this button right here to make the light that comes the other way. And we'll be doing the button pushing and making sounds that match the colors uh, later on, but that, that's uh, uh, to come yet. So, uh, that is the uh, first thing that I want you uh, to do is put the two diagonals uh, into this um, uh, rectangle and um, label them with a vector that, well, eventually we uh, want to take the phase vector and leave it there, but we're, we're going to have a group vector that's right here, and we will want to bring it down so that its, uh, its rear end is on the origin of the graph that makes it uh, uh, so it's uh, useful for geometry. And then we're going to do a trick. And that's the trick uh, that involves um, the uh, Thales rectangle and golden ratio uh, in this uh, thing. So, um, if the uh, phase velocity has a slope of, uh, say, say, it, say it represents things going 3C, then this one is just a flip of that, C over 3. 
Okay, so the group velocity of things that always are slower than the speed of light, and they can be negative too, but we're going to mostly keep them positive. And the phase is just the opposite. Uh, it is always faster than light. In fact, uh, it likes to go infinitely fast, whereas the group, it, when it's lazy, it just doesn't go anywhere. Zero speed. Okay, that's very different from superballs. This is the wave mechanics that um, we need to get used to uh, in order to get in the quantum and relativistic business. Now, one of the things I wanted to, want you to notice is uh, where the geometrical mean actually is. Okay, that's the uh, 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 key thing here. And so, how do you get that thing? You take your compass and you strike an arc uh, from the base and just hand me the white one there because I'm not going to write on the screen. I'll just pretend to write on the screen. Uh, basically, all I have to do to finish this thing is put the compass there and strike an arc and where it hits the axis is our answer, right? What could be simpler? <laughs> Now, um, later on, we're going to be interested in where it hits here and where it hits there because those have to be the actual frequencies of the two beams. The 600 terahertz is right there, and the uh, 300 terahertz is right there at the very edge of the screen. So that's 300 terahertz, that's 600 terahertz. We have just found the uh, mean uh, for that. Now, we have done a similar thing over on the blackboard there, and uh, that's where, uh, I, you know, in a few minutes, we'll be doing detailed geometry on top of that, and that's the second sheet that I've given you that's already a start of what we did in the last lecture. So, um, get ready for that. But I want to discuss this, this um, whole idea of a geometrical mean of light, and... Um, also realize that once I found that, okay, once I, once I realize that, th that I can bring both of these light beams down to the geometrical mean, or up to it, this one down to it, and this one up to it, okay, once I can do that, uh, is I'm going to have a, a nice center momentum diagram with two light beams with exactly the same frequency and as we'll see later, momentum, and that is the center of momentum uh, for this thing that Bob has finally found by going one-third the speed of light. It, what, how much would that cost? A, 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 a billion trillion dollars to get that much energy, but well, let's not worry about cost either. Uh, there's your 424 uh, terahertz that he now sees uh, in both directions. Okay. So he's, he's there uh, seeing a, uh, something that's on the border of infrared and visible. It's, it's, he's a, a male, so 15% of males can't see frequencies that are in that neighborhood. They're colorblind to that uh, red that uh, some of the lasers make. So they have to uh, figure out a way to get a little higher frequency so you, uh, the 15% of, of males could see a laser uh, pointer just an interesting aside that I think uh, you should know about. Okay, so uh, here's where we go uh, back in history, and I mean back to Mr. Thales in 600 uh, BC. The first uh, apparently man to really predict an eclipse, but he did a whole bunch of other things including this. The idea of having a circle cut across here at the geometrical mean of, well, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with four and one on the board over here. Four and one what? Well, four and one uh, 300 terahertz unit. So let's just review of what it is that we have over here because the first thing I'm going to have you do is strike an arc using a vertical uh, diameter right off of that phase point to find out where the uh, uh, geometrical mean of these two monsters, of this 
horrendous UV of 1200 terahertz uh, is coming across and colliding uh, with this much more benign uh, lift moving beam here, L vector, representing uh, 300 terahertz of something that goes at the speed of light, right at 45 degrees. Uh, and this one is 45 the other way, uh, getting uh, uh, this horrendous UV. So we're, this, this would be dangerous. You're out in the vacuum and they're shooting this stuff at you. Um, it's, it's worse than what you get when you do welding without a welding mask. You just get your face burned and you're, you may go blind. Okay, so you, this is dangerous stuff. Okay, it's called vacuum UV because most of the time when you turn on the thing, the vacuum, the air gets all excited and absorbs it. So you, you're saved a little bit uh, when you do welding without a, a mask, but not enough often. Okay, so that's the deal. Now, there's two other means here to come up. One of them is the difference mean, and that's going to be uh, if one of these is an exponential positive and the other is a negative exponential, that's going to be our hyperbolic sine, and this thing right here is going to be our hyperbolic cosine. We'll get into that later on, but right now just look at the arithmetic. Here's the arithmetic mean. If this is a geometrical mean, here's the arithmetic mean, which is half the sum of 1 plus Four, okay. Now these are units of of of, of uh, 300 terahertz. So it's, it's 1200 versus uh, 300 down there. The one being the 300 and this being the 1200. But um, basic idea is average. That's easy. That gives me a, something that's five halves in a height. And then uh, this thing right here is three halves in length. So these are going to be two very important coordinates uh, in our relativistic uh, discussion, uh, which is coming up here. So we already have now this uh, transform per time, the new per time, the new frequency uh, axis uh, that we're, we're getting here uh, uh, from this thing, the, the, that place. We're going to that place uh, where the beams have equal frequency equal frequency of, well, this is two 300 terahertz units, so this is that 600 terahertz uh, that's on the board over there. And we've, we've got to do so a lot more geometry uh, to get all of the other stuff that relativity and quantum mechanics has to offer, but um, we're in a good uh, shape to do that. So, um, let's see if I've got, uh, go ahead on this one and uh, point out uh, one of the things that's really uh, uh, crucial about this thing is, Thay always points out, that no matter where I subtend the diameter of this circle, here, which is the part we're interested in, or here's where we started, uh, I always have a right angle. Okay, and uh, that, there, in other words, there's a rectangle on the other side that's symmetric that sort of proves that um, whole geometrical uh, shtick. So, let's go ahead here and look at something else that is really important for uh, any of this um, optical uh, stuff, particularly if you're going to be talking about these two waves in a waveguide. But more to the point, if you're going to be talking about these two beams in general coming together, they're making a dispersion function that is a hyperbola. And that's why this is a hyperbolic cosine, uh, because this is a a hyperbola here that has a hyperbolic sign for its horizontal coordinate and a hyperbolic cosine. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Hyperbolic, you know, no, yeah, I was right the first time. Uh, uh, the hyperbolic cosine is here and the hyperbolic sine is here. It's, it's flipped over. You're used to having cosines this way and sine this way, right? Uh, that's Newtonian. This is Minkowski. Okay, this is uh, what we're going to be dealing with here. So. Um, what I would have you do first uh, on your graph is take a compass that actually draws uh, something, as I'm going to do right now, and be very careful and first make a line that goes uh, from the uh, tip of the phase vector to the main axis using the graph uh, to make it uh, a vertical. Okay, so I need to have uh, where is that line 
And I have little bits of lines uh, that are dark on the board that you maybe can't see. And probably, uh, maybe TC, it wouldn't hurt, I guess, to turn the overhead lights on so that everything up here is really visible. It, we got enough brightness in the screens for what we're doing today to get away with that. So what, what I need is the right one. Yeah. Um, left one is certainly going to work. Left button. That's the right button. There you go. There you go. Okay. That makes it a little easier to see, right? Okay. Anyway, I want this, I want this line, and I'm going to be really careful to try to get that in the center because we're going to use it for other things. I really need a good line to uh, the bottom, right over what should be halfway between 1 and 2. So at 1.5 is where I want uh, that line. And um, then we'll draw the magic circle. So I'm going to put the compass. And I see I'm a little off center there. It's uh, much harder to do these constructions on the thing. So I'm going to go ahead and just put this thing where it really should be, which is right in the center of those two black lines at the bottom of the of board here. And then I'm going to put this uh, point uh, right here as close as I can. And then I have to, without messing with things, tighten it right there and go ahead and draw a circle. Okay, so this is what I, I want you to go ahead and do. I have to tip it a little bit so it doesn't catch. I go right through there and come out. I should come out and it's not uh, quite doing it because I slipped a little bit there, but it should come out and you should be able to do a better job of this than I am getting here on the uh, 300 uh, terahertz uh, K vector. And then, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to draw the circle twice, one with a slightly bigger radius to make up for uh, what appears to be here. And this one should go and connect with the, the, ultra, the ultraviolet uh, thing. And you see it's just a little bit short, so I'm going to go ahead and draw this again. It's sort of a thick line. This is an important line and uh, we'll use the center of it uh, to uh, get our bearings later on. So, oh gosh, I'm, I'm slipping all over the place. The, the, the problem is I can't just poke this thing into the board and have it pivot, pivot like you can on a piece of paper. In any case, uh, this is a little better. Almost makes it to the 300 terahertz the way it should. And uh, I'll go ahead and do it do uh, another one this way as well. That, that thing has slipped a little bit since I... It's really primitive. Uh, Thales would be really angry with somebody doing a, such a terrible job with his geometry, but uh, he has long since died, so he, we don't have to worry. Okay, there's our uh, Thales uh, circle giving us the, the gold mean end. The, the, the geometrical mean, I'm sorry. And this is a rare case where it intersects that thing. That didn't happen with your first example. Okay, it was way off. But this one is, is, is sort of unique in that this line coming right through here is going through the geometrical mean point. That's the characteristic of this particular choice for Doppler shifts, uh, Doppler shift of uh, <coughs> two, oh. Wave this side of your mouth. Oh, right. Yeah, right there. Okay. Yeah, chalk. Bit. Yeah, <laughs> it you. might shine yeah. under the camera. Okay. Now, let, well, before I even put this compass down, let me point something out. Is that this is just the bottom point of this hyperbola. What I'd like you to do now is make a couple more points on the hyperbola. And this is really easy to do. This is a, a really magnificent construction. Again, the Thales discovered uh, that lets you uh, just go ahead and march up the from this point here. Okay, uh, that that circle. I would draw the whole circle, but let's just go uh, uh, say next door here uh, to two. 
okay? Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is set the compass now for the geometrical mean. Okay, I'm going to put that as close as I can uh, to the, uh, the two there, okay? And then I, I don't draw a whole curve. I'll just go right to this point right here and draw where the hyperbola uh, would be. And it's really close uh, to uh, this line. This line is a tangent to the hyperbola that we're going to be uh, 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 making uh, that goes uh, through that point right there. Now I go over here to three, okay, I should probably should go halfway, uh, just to get a, a, a good a take on this. Yes, we don't need that guy. Uh, for, so I'll make this thing uh, go through the, uh, the two point, and then I just make a little mark uh, right here, at, and it has to be right above, it has to be directly above things, so I'll put a little mark there, and you can see that point is a little bit higher, and this is the, uh, the, the, the tangent to the hyperbola. Hyperbola is going to continue up like this, leaving the tangent behind. And then here's three. I'm going to go to three now, set my compass, and this is about the limit I have, but you'll be able to cover the whole page uh, with your uh, geometrical tools. And I put a mark right there, okay? And then just uh, for the heck of it, I'll go, I'll see if I can go one more half, mm -hmm. uh, which would be here. Ah, you see, I am completely stretched out with my compass, but this will not happen to you on that uh, page. But I, I'm going right there, and then I have to come up and see where that lands uh, directly above. That's in a halfway point, and it's about there. And of course, it has to hit some place where I can't see it, but uh, it, it would be right there. Okay, that's where it would. So, uh, what, what you have now, and, you, and of course you can do the other side, uh, I can go here at the halfway point, put my compass there, and then uh, go up and see where it hits for that halfway point, and you can see it's really close to the tangent line. So I put a little dot there, and then maybe do, do one uh, half, halfway. Uh, well, I used to use this line right here. I'll, I'll make this thing, now I make it a little smaller, and come up, and when I go there, there's that dot. Uh, <coughs> let's see if that's right. Oh, oh I slipped, I slipped. I, I should have. Now you're in the dead. Yeah, that, that, that's not too bad. Okay, and then of course there there is a, a point on the hyperbola right there. We already know about it, but um, you, you keep doing this uh, with. Uh, if I go over here on this side. It's the same deal. I go to that point right there, and then uh, directly above wherever that directly above is. And, right in that neighborhood there, I should be uh, producing a, a, a <clears throat> part of the curve. So I'm just going to sort of roughly sketch out at this point. I'm sort of guessing now as I uh, uh, draw this uh, thing. It comes in here curving right there and then see if I, I I've got to find my marks right there. there there's a mark, there's a mark. I forget where, where the other ones are. And I'm so close to this thing that I, that I don't see it very well. But it, it, it should be a curving up something like that. There's the bottom. There's the uh, curvature of it. Just, just very roughly. And then it's tangent right there. Then it, it rises uh, here a little bit, a little bit more. And we were guessing a little bit right there. So there is the hyperbola that is tangent to that phase uh, point and also tangent uh, to the bottom, the lowest point, the lowest frequency, the center of momentum frequency or energy uh, is this two, 600 terahertz in frequency. Okay, so that is what I wanted you to see before we get going uh, right away to see the hyperbolic functions that 
I'll make up all of this arithmetic and algebra. Um, I ha have this as their geometry. Now, um, we'll see more hyperbolas that sit on either side, and then there's the antimatter that sits there. That's all getting way ahead of what we're doing now, uh, and Thale Thales would never have conceived of such a craziness uh, that we actually have in nature. So in any, any case, that, that is um, the simple construction, and you can flesh that out and get good at doing that, because I'm going to give you a grade of how good a hyperbole you make when it comes time to the final. Okay. You'll be doing basically what you're doing right now, except for different Doppler shifts. All right, so uh, let's um, go ahead here real quick and have some fun with this. TC has set this up so that we can uh, look at the uh, thing with our ears. And I have to go ahead to here uh, to see that. And let me find uh, where it is here. This is uh, a simulation of what we've just done. So let's get it, it uh, set up here. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, grab this thing and bring it home. So here's um, Bob going and setting himself up so he is right at home. And if I am careful enough here, I think I can make that turn green. In any case, these are all of the coordinate grids and everything uh, coming together here at the center of momentum. I don't have a snap two on that. You'd have to key it in the controls to get it exact. Um, yeah, that, I would. Yeah, I was able to get get it right on the green. In any case, let's see how far we are by listening. Uh -huh. And you can hear beats, so you know I'm not right there. really I'm having a hard time um, ma making it uh, there but in any case as you move away and, and this is just like a tenth of speed of light now but we're using sound in a funny way the beats are you know hard for your ear to uh, pick up so the, 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 up the hyperbola we go and now we're really hearing the high frequencies of the uh, blue. And I'll come back down again. And there's some circles that we're going to be drawing a uh, tangent to each other right there. It's really hard to find that point where they... Use the control panel and just key it in exactly and then they'll be convinced that it's, yeah, I, it's too... Uh, I go here and difference. key in. Uh, right at the top, you got group velocity. Make that zero. Make that as close to zero as well, I can. You can you can select the text and make it zero. It's quickest. Oh, oh okay. I'll do that. I have had bad luck doing that. I'll go. Yeah, oh, that's zero. different than the old one. All right. There we go. So there. Now when we display it, that that's where we are. And I just touch it. It's going to go into a beats. You can hear the beats. We, 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 okay, and same frequency on the other side. Okay, isn't that fun? <laughs> but we actually add a little bit of multimedia in there and make, uh, make fun of physics. Okay, so let me turn the acoustics off here and you can play with that on your own time. The, uh, and, your, and your own ears. We got How some smiles there? from that, so that was... Uh, one of the things that I should probably do we're going any further here is set this on play and get rid of that thing there and then um, do what it's good at. <laughs> oh, and I've got the wrong, that's weird, I, I've got the wrong uh, thing. I thought you were segueing here, I sort of stopped you. Um, menu and see what's it's the wrong uh, lecture. Uh, let's go back and get our 29, just what uh, we're dealing with here. And there, there, um, I might have had better luck with it because it's a bigger uh, screen. But anyway, let's go on. Um, the thing that I want to point out about that hyperbola is we've seen these before when we were talking about a two-level system. And I'm going to get that guy uh, going over there. Let's go. 
here, the uh, conical intersection, the thing's called Dirac points. You've been hearing a lot about these things. Um, used to be called Diablos. We talked about them uh, in our two-level system uh, discussions. Uh, and it's just a cross-section, a hyperbolic cross-section of two cones intersecting each other. And this is uh, a two-level system, but now if you put polarization on it, it's, it's a four-level system. That's a complete uh, an analog, optical analog of what we're uh, dealing with here. Uh, we're ignoring the polarization, so all we get are two hyperbolas to play with. But um, those hyperbolas are degenerate if there's polarization. So that was stuff that we talked about before. Now I'd like to here introduce you to a completely different and very <laughs> unfortunately unpopular way uh, to parameterize uh, relativity. Uh, we're doing a longitudinal parameter, rho, to logarithm of the Doppler shift. Okay? Um, there's a transverse parameter that um, hides in the literature. And um, this was the whole method of teaching by a guy named, <laughs> you can't write this stuff, Lewis Carroll Epstein, not Einstein, Epstein. Okay, he's a pro professor at uh, San Francisco City College, which is a, a feeder school for Berkeley, for, uh, as far as science goes. Uh, if you couldn't get into Berkeley the first time, go over to uh, uh, City College, get a really interesting course by people like th this, and get into Berkeley in his second, third year or whatever uh, of your time there. So what this is, is the angle that a beam coming across my motion, as opposed to along my motion or uh, against my motion, but a perpendicular to it, and so there's a star up there, and this is why it's called stellar aberration. If I can get going really fast, uh, that star will move ahead. And that's a little bit paradoxical at first. You figure, I'm going to have a race with, suppose there's a spacecraft up there, way, way, way up there. Okay, and we're having a race, and uh, right now we're at uh, the same speed, so he's always up there. And so I, I want to get ahead of him, right? And the light's coming straight down, okay? So I put on my rockets and start going really fast. Okay, so presumably I'm going a lot faster than he is because maybe I'm talking to him and he says, I'm not going to change I can't go any faster. And, and what's going to happen is it's going to look like he's going ahead. Uh, many paradoxes in this business. And then obviously, if I get really going fast, he's going to be right in front of me. And the frequency is going to go up and whatever light he has coming in gamma rays at me. That's stellar aberration. That's the other side of this whole business with relativity. And Lewis Carroll uses that to visualize relativity. And I'll just sketch this real quickly, but it's, it is quite remarkable. And I invited him to come, or actually it was another fellow that invited him to come after seeing what we were doing. And it was interesting because he just really wasn't interested in even talking about Rowe or you know, the normal way to do relativity, he just some, somehow had a bad thing with it and just never, never had anything to do with Lorentz transformation in its normal form. So it's kind of an obvious thing. Anyway, if you make uh, uh, light beams uh, going away or coming together, uh, this is in a laser frame, this is in a moving uh, frame. Uh, they, one will bend this way and the other will bend the other way. This one will get purple, this one will get red. So this is the generalization of the Doppler shift to all three spatial dimensions. And it, it is, you know, uh, symmetric. So if there was something coming out of the board here, it would bend like these do. So th th this is the hyperbolic sign versus the sign. And that's the geometry we're going to be building. We're going to be building that, this little thing here I call Oakham's sword. We'll get to that in a minute. But the basic idea, the arithmetic of that is pretty well summed up with that diagram. And um, I can go ahead here and show you the connection between the Epstein sigma, the stellar aberration angle. And <clears throat> by the way, he just had theta for that angle, but my gosh, 
why why shouldn't you pick sigma as the flip of the rho, right? <laughs> I mean, it's S for stellar and rho for rapidity, so the Greek alphabet is, is uh, being honored. But here, what we find when we make our connections, uh, and that table that I showed you just at the beginning of the class that you have on your desk, has uh, ordinary secants, uh, and they're equal to hyperbolic cosine, and then uh, the hyperbolic secant, well, that's equal to the cosine of sigma. Okay, so there's this connection between the rows and the sigmas you can use either one uh, just as easily. And if your calculator won't do hyperbolics, then you have to use the sigma. The sigma also is really uh, useful in the sense that what he did, and this is, this is the crazy thing that, that he did uh, to, to get this to, uh, to work, was he just turned the, um, the space and the time inside out so he made proper time uh, the uh, uh, a variable uh, 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 that um, that uh, uh, describes the time. So uh, he has uh, a connection here where the Lorentz contraction. Uh, that's this thing right here. Okay, uh, that's this. Okay, it's just a cosine. All right, the Einstein time dilation. Okay, that's just a secant. Uh, all of this, this stuff hangs together in a rather remarkable way. The proper time a simultaneity, that's the other thing that is most amazing about relativity, is to first order the axes uh, come together uh, at different angles. So this is all stuff that's, you know, I think has, I mean, the idea is to put this together, and that's what we're going to do today, uh, geometrically. Uh, but um, just the idea here, this is the trick. Uh, being stated at the bottom of the screen uh, right here. The trick is to turn a hyperbolic form for the proper time, which is a difference between time squared and space squared, to turn that into a Pythagorean form, where you have the proper time being plotted against the space uh, thing. So that's what's going on here, the proper time being plotted. That's a big advantage if you want to do twin paradox of geometry. Um, and that's, we'll talk about that uh, later on, maybe at, you know, in, on Wednesday. But this, this is a, a much better way uh, to visualize the Lorentz uh, contraction and all of the things that Minkowski gives us happens in a space. This is not a space. This is what a mathematician would call a chart. I mean, you know, you basically, everybody gets to put his time on this axis and they all have different uh, readings depending on how fast they're going. If, uh, if, if, for example, you're going at the speed of light, which is this uh, thing right here, you never gain proper time. You never age. If you're just a little bit above that, you age very slowly. If you're coming straight on like this, you age as fast as you can. So that, that uh, is, in a nutshell, the uh, thing that makes the uh, Epstein thing neat. But it just left the students so mystified and they didn't learn the other side of it. So, And he couldn't get this published. And finally his father had a printer printing shop so he went and he self-published the thing. And the book is, a couple of books are, are back there. I've got several copies. So if you're interested in that, it, you, you really ought to look at it. If you're going to teach relativity, this is the thing to, uh, you know, his approach is fair game and with the stuff we're doing, uh, it gives you a lot of insight. Okay, now we're going to do this guy. This is uh, where we <clears throat> take the uh, case of the uh, 1200 uh, and the 300 uh, uh, bu light beams are going to fight it out to the last core here. Okay, so I'm going to get the, both of these going on the screens here and we're going to, at each step, make another move on this uh, thing. Now one of the things that I want to get out of this is somewhere in this geometry is the stellar aberration angle and this scale is designed to to track that. Now you could assign an angle to the phase vector if you want to. It isn't very useful but as long as you've got the protractor you might as well read it off and it has a, a nice formula for it too. Okay. 
But I'm interested in finding where the stellar aberration angle is for something that's going three-fifths the speed of light. And that's what we've got uh, on this particular graph on the board here. And this is a, 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 a rendering of that. So, first thing to do, we've already done this. Draw the uh, arc there. Okay, now this one doesn't have the errors that I've put into that one. If you do it correctly, your circle should go a little bit above this ultraviolet line. Remember, this is the ultraviolet right moving uh, laser beam. And it's, it, it cruises just a little bit above, but it's got to go through four or you've done something wrong. Four units, that's 600 terahertz. Uh, we're doing 150 terahertz units here, both in the frequency and then the wave number, but the wave number times C, that's frequency again. So the, the, that makes the geometrical units the same for both axes, even though physically they're very different. This is per space, waves per uh, meter, and this is waves per second. That's actually written in very faint language underneath uh, the, the unit box. Okay, so here uh, we have uh, that circle already drawn, and notice that it cuts the axis right at minus 2, and then cuts over here to cut at 8, 8 times 150 terahertz units. That's, that's our uh, 1,200 uh, terahertz, uh, if this was a, a, in frequency units, okay? So this, this cutting through here is right underneath the R vector. And this one is right underneath the L vector, left and right, okay? And then half the sum of right and left is this guy, right? There's the complete sum right there, okay? This guy plus that guy is that vector. That's twice as big as we want. There's where the phase is, right there, halfway. You've already got that, but just to remind you. Okay, so uh, let's jump ahead here. Uh, one more step, and that is uh, go ahead and draw a box. I already got mine drawn, so I didn't really have to draw this. Uh, um, but you need to have a box that goes 1,200 terahertz across the top, drops to the bottom. So you have a square that's 1,200 terahertz on a side. And then over here you've got a square that's 12, uh, I'm sorry, 300 terahertz on a side. Representing, of course, a light going at its speed with a negative velocity on that uh, uh, side. Okay, so here are your um, Doppler redshift frequency box, and then this is the uh, 1200 Doppler blue shift frequency box uh, right here. So that <coughs> it makes it easier for some of the things we're going to do uh, shortly here. Okay, so make sure you've got uh, that um, in place. So everybody has one of these pieces of graph paper you got. Yeah. That, that's going to be the second thing you do on the final exam. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's see what's next here. If a circle here is cool, how about a circle on the, on the uh, y-axis. The circle that's centered on the x-axis is our, our Thales circle. Uh, who wants to take a name for this one? It's a very uh, uh, important part of this uh, thing. Now, to get that um, circle going, and let me get it going on this uh, graph here, to get that circle going, I need to know where the uh, halfway point is. That's I need to have graph paper that tells me where to draw that circle right opposite the phase uh, vector. Now, the phase vector suddenly has got color, colored uh, green instead of blue. I use green for group. should be using blue for that, but it won't change mm -hmm. on your uh, graph. 
So I, I need to draw a circle that goes right to that point. I've got to find my compass uh, in order to do that. Um, let's see if I where have I put the dastardly thing? Uh, <laughs> Here's your chip right next to your mouse. Oh, hiding. Okay, there we go. Thank you. And so what I need is a circle. And my, my point, I can see it on the board right there, is there. So the circle I'm going to be drawing is right through there. I'm going to try to get this right on that. And this is one I really want to be careful with while I'm drawing uh, in, in this neighborhood. Now this one should also uh, cut through the 300 me uh, terahertz location. Okay? And that, that worked out just fine this time. Okay? So if you, you're doing years with pencil, you can erase and there's lots of things that you check as we build these constructions. Ah, I slipped a little bit there. Keep going. And if I hadn't slipped, I would have gone through this and it's looking like I'm going to end up just a little bit shy where I should be, which is the four. Okay. That's a little sad there. I'm going to go ahead and sponge up a little bit. And the trouble with this whole blackboard thing is that these lines were made by me and they have in, in, in precision uh, that you don't have with your computer graphics that you're working with. Anyway, that's a circle that um, we uh, can do something with, as we'll, as we'll see. Okay? So there we, there, so far we have two circles around important points that are going to set up the geometry of relativity and quantum mechanics, basically. Now, uh, there's something, uh, uh, this is all uh, celebrating logic. And so, remember I uh, talked about Occam's razor uh, at the beginning of this course. Uh, now we're going to uh, build Occam's sword. That's just my name for something that's a little more substantial than a razor. And uh, we get that uh, by making a little set of lines here, a little staircase. It's a zigzag, actually. It could go, it's a zigzag that's respecting something important. And so, uh, I would like you to go ahead and make an outline of the Occam sword. And this I can do just with a ruler. And I already have part of it uh, there already because the graph main lines uh, let me just continue down to that point and go across. And I've got the first part of Occam's, uh, the very tip of what I call Occam's sword. And um, then the thing that I do after I go here is make a line right to origin. So let's uh, let me get the, the ruler that will let me do that precisely <clears throat> and put it up here. It's got little magnets on it. So I just have to aim the thing at the um, origin and then put down uh, right at that point. In such a way that when I draw the line with the thickness of the chalk, you see that's the other thing that I have a disadvantage here is the chalk is thick. But what I want to do is go from the origin and do it just right so I am tangent to that circle that we just draw, just drew. And then I stop right there. Okay? That was a pretty lousy line. Let me make it a little thicker and less wavering. But there's where I want to uh, stop. Now, you, you probably uh, should um, go ahead and at this point uh, draw a dashed line up this way. Because what you've just found by doing this particular line is the direction where the stellar aberration, and you can even go and put the thing out here and draw a little star 
for the star that you were once was directly over you, and it's going to be over here now for the, something going this fast. Okay, so there's there's a um, a sword consists of the main phase line, and then a cutting edge here, and the main cutting edge there. That is the um, thing that we want. We want to uh, increase that uh, uh, considerably here, uh, doing some other things. Yes. And just to make sure I'm getting this, the you drop straight down from the phase line, and then phase point. Over, yeah. And then we come over from where the circle that we made with that phase point. Yes. Across the this, this guy. There's the center up there. Yeah. But this guy is important too, where where the circle cuts. This is the geometrical mean. Now, as I've warned you, this particular uh, example is very special. That this line comes through there also. Yeah. You saw that it didn't happen with that other example. Yeah. So that, that, you know that's the thing about geometry. You get these coincidences that can really screw you up because you think they mean something, turns out they don't. Which is why I want to do this. Make enough. sure that that was the points yeah. that we used for the. You definitely want to do that. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I might as well adventure off to the next one because what I really need is a is this um, base circle goes through four. This is the circle that represents where we would be if we got this thing into the rest frame. So let's put that circle uh, up there <coughs> uh, as well. That means I have to find my compass again and go ahead and try to draw uh, that one. And that one is just gotten by going to the very bottom of my graph here, but also the, your, your graph paper, and putting in a circle. And this we'll call the base circle. I'm going to see where, where my chuck point actually is before I start doing this. Because th this is one I would really like to get right. Otherwise, there'll be little gaps that you can see. But you shouldn't have much trouble. And so I'm going to bring this guy over to the sword. I hope I don't slip. And what you'll notice is, if you've done it right, is it goes right through the tangent point of the sword with that um, second circle. And then I'm going to go ahead and take it all the way down. And it better land, land on the two. That is, it better land on a 600 terahertz uh, thing. And it did a pretty good job that time. Now, I, I, I don't really need it over here for much of the stuff we're going to do today, but I'm going to go ahead and draw it for possible future use. There's our baseline circle. And I, um, most of the uh, papers that you read that I, the text that we that I uh, uh, have for you uh, that is colored green. I don't know where that comes from. Trying to be uh, agrarian or something. But in any case, that that is a pretty important um, base of our thing. I've drawn a purple here. So that's our base circle, and then the, the cord, there's a cord uh, right here that we've already uh, drawn, but that should go right through. Okay, so if you're making a, a triple point there, that's, that's correct. And um, see if there's anything else I left off. <coughs> I think that's it. Okay, now, um, it doesn't hurt uh, to uh, go down from here, and you will also hit that point. Okay, so this is this is where the hyperbolic signs and the ordinary sign and the hyperbolic tangent thing all are playing a game with us right now. Uh, uh, there at that at, at that point, I'm referring to. I'm going to just put the ruler here to show you where. I, one. It's the, the rest of the zigzag. <clears throat> okay, I need, a, I need a draw right there. I'll just do it lightly. It should go straight down 
And I even had a graph liner in there that showed that is what I want. Okay. And where do you set the ruler? Say again. Where did you set the ruler? Oh. Is this a random place? I, I put it where this line intersected. And if I drop. With what? Uh, if I drop straight down uh, there, Vertical, I run to this intersection with the base circle and the uh, stellar aberration line. That's what we want. It's bouncing between those two rays. I should get over here and just go ahead and draw it, zip, right there and stop there. So there is the um, Occam sort with one more line in it, okay? Zig, zag, another zig. We've got another zag here that is of interest, and that's this one. From there to there, that intersection. Okay, and now we've got most of the hard part of the structure of this um, <clears throat> Thales construction. I mean, Thales, someday maybe they dig up his word and find out he did this already. <laughs> he beat Einstein by six centuries. But um, Einstein didn't do this, even though it is rumored Dudley Hirschbach told me that um, Einstein was all set to be a devout Catholic. And he was reading the Bible, 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 and catechism, catechism, blah, blah, blah. And his uncle brought him a ruler and a compass. A Bible and a catechism went out the back door. And from then on, he was doing mathematics. Kind of interesting. And I believe Dudley Hirschbach, because he, he studies stuff like this uh, all the time. Now, actual algebraic formulas. Here's where we check out, and you can check out, I can, without a diagram like you've got here. Where is the stellar aberration angle? It turns out it's arc sine of three-fifths, the speed uh, that we would um, have here. The arc hyperbolic tension of three-fifths uh, is going to be the actual groove velocity, but uh, this uh, uh, here is... Um, I, I, I think fascinating in the, in the sense that this angle here and all the way through here and, and what's also important is where that intersects the circle we've got to keep that line going so that's fine just to have the sword there like that but this curve right here has the same curvature as the hyperbola if I drawn it carefully and um, this curve is called a Lagrangian, actually minus a Lagrangian. It's upside down. It, where it really is is at the, you know, under the basement down there. But um, this uh, line right here uh, is an important line because what it's going to be doing is by its length giving us, it will give us the Lagrangian of this particular velocity that we're working with here, the three-fifths speed of light. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this line right here, all the way to the bottom. And that makes the stellar aberration angle, which is this angle right here, the polar angle of the Lagrangian. That's what it is. That's what this, 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 uh, thing here is going to be pointing out to your protractor uh, 31 degrees or whatever it is and it, it, we get pretty close actually 36 degrees it's 37 uh, degrees more like 37 degrees okay it's really close so this is where you check to see how how well you did and you can use your uh, calculator to figure out what you should have gotten to see how close you, you get and if you can just get anywhere near close, I can give you the full credit, but maybe I'll give you extra credit if you can get four decimal places uh, with geometry. Pretty unlikely. 
but uh, it's fun to try. Sure. Okay, so we do need um, that extra line, um, <clears throat> and there's the uh, hyperbola popping up very nicely there. But um, that that other that uh, the rest of this construction after the hyperbola are the actual functions that um, uh, we're getting. We we get a whole bunch of functions here uh, that um, <coughs> play a role, and they're tabulated in that table that I gave you. This guy right here is B. Now B is the diameter of this circle. B is the base circle, radius B. Okay, that we. I guess I didn't mention that very carefully when we, we talked about it, but every one of these functions has that B attached to it. That's what gives it the scale uh, that um, is the value. B hyperbolic secant is right there. That is the Lagrangian. It happens, well, it's minus the Lagrangian, actually. It happens to be, without the minus sign, the inverse. So it's the inverse and the minus of the Hamiltonian. That is the Hamiltonian right there that goes straight up and is the height of the hyperbola for this particular velocity. So that's being taken care of very nicely. And the hyperbolic cosine has a hyperbolic sine to go with it. That turns out to be quantum momentum. So hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine. Now, you're used to the cosine being horizontal, as I say, this is Minkowski. So the sine is the thing that's horizontal here. Then there's the actual B value right here. That's just the radius of the circle. That's what you're going to get when you're in the center of momentum, and the momentum of the uh, thing has gone to zero. So we have zero momentum when rho goes to zero. And this right here, all wonders of wonders, is the actual relativistic velocity, the hyperbolic tangent. And it should be sitting uh, there to give us three-fifths. This is a three-fifths speed here, so this thing, this thing should come out uh, with a three-fifths in our, our units that we have. So this is pretty much all of the uh, geometry that is hiding in this collision of waves, basically. The collision that makes a, a Minkowski graph. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, let's get some numbers right. Let's do the algebra. Remember, and this you might want to have just written down in your <laughs> head, that the group is minus the half sum, and the phase is the half sum. So it's uh, half sum, half difference that give us um, all of the uh, functions that we need. And it's half sum and half difference of uh, the right vector and the left vector. The right vector consisting of two high frequency, 600 terahertz, e to the rho quantities. And it's just going at the speed of light, which is 45 degrees, straight up there. And we're taking the half uh, sum, half difference of that. So we take the half sum of right, and then the half difference or sum of the left, which is about that big. So we, we go this way, or we go this way to get phase or group, respectively. This one, when you do the minus, I'll give you that. So. Um, that's the geometry. I could draw uh, this half vector uh, right here at the center, pointing up at 45 degrees to that point to give me the P, and then uh, the G is gotten by going the other way, putting the minus sign uh, on that left vector, half of that left vector. Do you always set the higher frequency to be the right one? Say again, the do higher you, frequency? Do you always set the higher frequency to be the right one? No. And you just give me a suggestion. I can I can make the exam go backwards, right? Fair enough. I won't. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's enough trouble to memorize all this stuff. <laughs> but, uh, you know, good question. Yeah, no. In fact, all of the animations go either way. 
symmetry. Definitely have symmetry. This is that would be P symmetry of CPT, charge conjugation, parity, time reversal. Right? Remember that business that you hear about if you're following high energy physics at all. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, is there anything else here? Yeah, the numbers. Okay, the numbers. The phase, which is taking uh, this guy right here and adding it to this guy right here, but he's got a negative in his first thing because he's pointing the other way. He's got a, this is the uh, x component, you might say, uh, whereas this is a time component. So when I put those two together, I get this thing right away. I get a sign right off the bat uh, in that component of the phase of vector. That's this component right here. That's this component right here. Which we've got hyperbolic sine is the difference of the two exponentials. The big high frequency and the low frequency, blue and red shifted uh, Dopplers. Then it all comes straight as a sum for the second component, and that makes it cos. And that's the second component. That's the vertical component. And there's the Kaj right there. Does that make sense? And you can see that this is really hard if I just were to go through and not have you actually do it, right? The, 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 this is something you learn by doing. So it's something when you go to teach a course in relativity, use Epstein, use Harderstein and Einstein, you you got it all. <laughs> it's lots of fun. Okay, let's see if there's anything else here besides the numbers themselves. You know, go ahead and jump this one two spots. Okay. Now I put an extra thing in there uh, when I actually put the numbers anyway. Here's sine cosh and cosh sine, uh, the flip, this guy uh, in the group is cosh first and sine second, okay, and so the components, the actual components of where these things, well this one's easy, 1200 and 1200, this one uh, over here is 300 minus 300, and I didn't put the minus in, I can see that right, it's minus 300, 300, uh, there's the minus uh, I should have put in there. Okay. Anyway, the, together they make, with a half difference, they make this, 450, that's this, 450 terahertz, and then 750 terahertz is the hyperbolic cost. That's this one. Okay. The other is the reverse. If your group doesn't flip its components, something's wrong. So this one is 450, 750, this is 750, 450 has to be flipped. And I flip around the light cone. This one goes always faster than light. This one goes slower than light. So B sine hyperbolic is group velocity? Group velocity. Uh-huh. Is that? Group velocity is really defined as the half difference. And uh, where can we go back to uh, see that? Um, I'm thinking uh, that, uh, what is B sine hyperbolic? What is B sine? This mm -hmm. uh, Right. That comes here, which came from here. Okay. The phase, you, you see, uh, is half difference of this guy and this guy. So it's what physical quantity is B sine hyperbolic? In this case, the hyperbolic sine will be good old-fashioned classical momentum. That's, that's going to be our de Broglie momentum. And this is kind of interesting because they didn't... Einstein kind of had it half written down in 1905, but it wasn't until 21 that de Broglie says, hey, you, you, you got a formula there for momentum that's true for in a relativistic world. And if you look at that table that I've given you there, the um, let me you, use yours just to hold it up and point, because uh, it's way ahead in the picture. I'm thinking of 
this quantity, the hyperbolic sine, which is right there, okay, that uh, that is going to be, I mean, right, right here, it's, it's past future asymmetry. That's what it means. Thing. But when we do this table over again, this will be our momentum column right here. You can write it as hyperbolic sine of rho, or you can make it tangent of sigma. The um, velocity, on the other hand, is this guy right here. That's the actual classical velocity, but it is the group velocity, V group. This one is frequency of the group is the hyperbolic sign. The lambda of the group is hyperbolic secant. That's the one that's Lorentz contraction. And uh, this one right here is kappa, the k vector of the group. Okay, that turns out to be cosh. And then finally, these guys over here are Rayleigh wavelengths and things like that. This is the inverse of the so-called past future asymmetry. That sounds spooky, but it's, uh, it, it, it has a, a mechanical uh, definition that's uh, really key uh, to this. Does that help at all? To, um, so I would recommend uh, looking these guys over. And then it, it, it's perfectly free uh, here. Uh, to go to the next uh, page in that thing when you have your browser working and just see what this thing does when you uh, play with it. Now, this, uh, firstly, th this is the whole diagram turned on its side. There's the hyperbola we're working with right now. But um, here goes the, uh, as you go, uh, starting here, where everything is one or zeros, as you come up, you see the uh, hyperbolic secant, that's the thing that's the, uh, the vertical in uh, this, this uh, thing right here. That's the Lagrangian, okay? And then there's a, a hyperbolic tangent connected to that. that that's uh, uh, right there. Now, I'm, I'm going to go ahead here and uh, show you something that's important if you want to play with this. Uh, for some reason, um, I'm looking for the uh, thing, the, the uh, scale factor, font scale factor. For some reason, this one uh, came out too. We've been trying to get it so that it wasn't so large. It's an old so I'm going to bring it down here so they don't cover each other, but you can still read it. Uh, like about one would be nice. Okay. Can you still read that? Okay, now they don't cover each other. But uh, here's where you can see, and the, the whole idea, of course, of all of this is the sign plays footsie with the tangent, okay? The sign and the hyperbolic tangent of their respective variables, sigma and rho, are the same. And then the tangent and the hyperbolic sign are a different number, but also the same to each other. Then the secant and the cosh go together. And here's the sec hyper and the cos, cosine, okay? They're two equals that play with each other. And finally, as an inverse of, of, of both of those. Uh, the tangent here uh, gets to be cotangent down here. That's the in inverse function. So all of this weird trigonometry that I've never seen anybody do this just for the fun of it, of the trigonometry. Uh, but goodness, all of these quantities mean something, mean a heck of a lot. It's just everything that's going on inside you and outside you uh, uses these parameters. Uh, it's really quite uh, something. So you can take these things to extremes. And remember, they are quantities that are the areas of the respective curves. And it's both areas. When this thing goes to pi, I mean the whole circle, whole unit circle, pi. That area is sigma. This area right here plus this area is rho. So that's, that's the, the factor of two that's, that's in this business. And you know the factor of two is going to come when you have two state systems. So, um, okay, well, 
it's one of those cases where an hour is not enough, but there's a picture of the thing that um, is on the back of your textbook. The uh, whole idea here, and I go ahead and start it up. Here we show the the actual coordinate grid that is uh, making uh, the waves that, that define the Minkowski graph. But uh, as you take it out here, the Oakham sword gets really big. And the other thing that I drew here is this tangent. Now this is kind of interesting because that's the Legendre transform. Here is going to be the Hamiltonian, we'll be getting that on Wednesday, of momentum. It has to be a function of momentum, and this is why. That wasn't dictated by the pulp. That was because momentum goes to infinity. Momentum doesn't have a limit to its, its scope. Momentum is huge. And there's no limit to this energy called the Hamiltonian. It, it goes right up the hyperbola to infinity. No problem. But the Lagrangian is different because it's the inverse of the Hamiltonian and it's negative of it. And so if it's limited by C, so when you go to really high energy physics, this tangent steps over and you're down here with a tiny Lagrangian, you see. And that's why high energy physicists use Lagrangian because it didn't blow up. Over there, that's where the uh, hadron colliders work. They work in you know, a single pixel of the screen right here. And we work in a single pixel of the screen right there. We get one electron ball over a typical day, right? That's the way we work with our solids, right? In any case, I go from this tangent, the tangent, the green thing right there, it intercepts right at the Lagrangian. And then that tangent intercepts here at the Hamiltonian. So there's your Legendre transformation this is back and forth on that cross on those two tangents. The tangent of the hyperbola the Hamiltonian uses, the tangent of the Lagrangian of the circle that the, the Lagrangian uses. Had enough? <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> I won't be able to show you all of this stuff, but I'll, I'll flip through it just to give you a feeling of what you have. There's the open sword. Where does that open sword really help? Well, when you're doing um, actual motion in space and time, and you can play with these, these things are movies of things happening. But here's where you have a waveguide. A waveguide has a group and a phase velocity, and it's being determined by an Occam sword. This is where the waveguide would like to be. It'd like to have almost the speed of light. But uh, if you have a waveguide that's operating just at the uh, threshold of what they call the cutoff, uh, you get a situation like this with really long wavelengths. And you get a very tiny Occam sword and you get a very small group velocity because the thing has to go woo, 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 on these uh, lines back and forth uh, that you see with the blue arrows. That's Cool, to, be under, to understand this stuff. Now, in a place where you can control it, not just a beam out in the middle of a vacuum, now we start to think about uh, how we could do uh, optics of crazy kinds of optics at high frequencies. So anyway, that is that. There's both of them together, a, a really uh, fast wave uh, with short wavelength and then a really slow wave with long wavelength. Circular waves, really interesting to study. And uh, then what's in a synchrotron beam? Now you can see where the colors are. Where can you see uh, in a synchrotron? And, and then that um, it gets very narrow when you get, start to get to high speed. This is only three quarters uh, speed of light. Uh, 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 synchrotrons go a lot more than that. Anyway, that's pretty much it for now. Um, we'll take on the quantum business using uh, what we've developed here on Wednesday. Thank you.